Yeah. Hi, I'd like to welcome to the Rod Goble Gallery for the fourth of our eight Master Series Art Lectures. Tonight our speaker is Ray Marie Taylor, who is both artist, writer, poet, and lecturer. She's going to be speaking tonight on the effects, or the influence rather, of Kandinsky, Thoreau, Walt Whitman, and Emerson on the New Mexico Transcendentalist painters such as Raymond Johnson and Emil Bistrom. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's it. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you all for coming tonight. It's such a nice crowd. I'm, I'm really pleased, and I'm really pleased to be in Taos. I don't get a chance to come up often enough, so this was a great chance to come. Um, <coughs> louder? Uh, like this? That's, I think this is just for the recording, so <coughs> I'll try and project better. They say poets need training in projecting the voice. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, as Nora mentioned, I am very interested in the possible associations between uh, the transcendentalist writers of, in the American culture and the group here uh, in New Mexico, the transcendentalist painters. I don't think that it was totally by chance that Bistrom um, chose that expression, particularly beca because he has a painting entitled Oversoul, which was a, co a term that um, Emerson coined uh, in his development of the intuition and the experience of the ground <sighs> ground of experience from which all life and manifestation comes. So what I would like to do, I'm not searching to try and prove anything in these relationships, but only to offer them as a reflection for us here together this evening. Um, basically, if you think more in terms of uh, quantum dynamics of how quantum fields relate to each other it, rather than a linear development in time of the associations between these people. I think um, it'll be easier to to grasp the sense that I'm simply trying to present the affinities between the trans early transcendentalists and how those affinities are manifested later. Um, it's also uh, for me in the back of my mind as I was preparing this lecture, there is a sense of <clears throat> that relationship between the European culture and art, the American culture, and the West. I'm a woman of the West who lived away in a much more European country, uh, in North America, in Quebec, but still very much more European connected for many years. And so, and I came back to the West, and um, I think Raymond Johnson came back very much to the West when he returned, even though I don't know nearly enough about him uh, as I'd like. But I do definitely have that sense that the West mattered deeply to him and that his coming and staying in the West uh, was a, an important choice for his work and for his life. So we'll be dealing with three times and three places. Um, the early American transcendentalists who call themselves transcendentalists, but went in the 1830s, uh, represented mostly by Emerson, the essayist, Thoreau, the philosopher, and uh, Whitman, the poet. I won't really be quoting them from all of their works except for Emerson, just to set the tone of the preoccupations of that transcendentalist movement. That movement was um, ruptured, I guess you could say, by the Civil War and its members somewhat dispersed, and we know of stories of Whitman in the prison hospitals and stuff taking care of the prisoners. Um, the Kandinsky, the movement of Central European expressionism that Kandinsky was so much the writer philosopher for, um, as well as the, one of the major innovator painters, um, was also a movement concerned with this sense of transcendence, a sense of the spiritual, and was also interrupted by the First World War. And some of its members um, were uh, killed in the First World War. The transcendental <coughs> transcendentalist painters here in uh, New Mexico um, lost a member or two to the Second World War. And in 
the art historian context, the transcendentalist painters of New Mexico are identified as being really the viable movement uh, between 1938 and 1941. So, I'm not drawing any conclusions, but it's one of the elements, um, this concern with the spiritual that seems to surface so strongly and mobilize a number of people before um, outbreaks uh, of war <laughs> in art history. Uh, whether that sense of, of the disaster that's approaching is something that artists are more sensitive to. There are many discussions about that kind of thing, and so the affirmation of life becomes more important uh, there are many theories we could draw, but I simply want to mention those things in in the, a global context of culture, Western European culture, and to point out that in the American culture, in this very, very young country that we still are, um, there was a movement that articulated the kind of spiritual uh, artistic preoccupations that Kandinsky and the Expressionists had a um, hundred years before. It was mostly through the writers um, in New England, uh, represented by Emerson and Thoreau, etc. But one of their premises was that the the only way spiritual could be truly expressed was through art. And this is one of the main elements of the manifestos of the Kandinsky period, that the other in, more institutionalized or culturally acceptable forms of expression um, of religion interfere with the true communication of the grasp of the spiritual experience of the absolute, etc. And when we begin talking about the absolute, that's one of Kandinsky's terms, and it's one that Johnson adap adopted um, very seriously. Uh, we are definitely talking about that search in abstract art for expression of uh, that elemental, original type of experience without interference of cultural or, or social representation. So those are the kinds of associations that I'd like to, to bring together. Um, I feel that the early transcendentalist writers are responsible for articulating this um, fundamentally human tendency or aspiration uh, towards what they call the transcendent in art. Uh, and I feel that the receptivity in the American culture a hundred years later uh, to the European impetus from Kandinsky and, and later from uh, the Bauhaus as it developed with Clay and others is really what ripened that receptivity. It's really the, the transcendentalist writers in the beginning that became, in spite of the fact that they did not continue consistently for a hundred years as a movement, um, they very much influenced the American mind and the, there was a receptivity in the culture for these ideas that people like Bistrom and, and Johnson responded to early on and uh, continued to develop throughout their lives. Um, so, that's the global view. <laughs> now if we get down to a few more particulars, I would like to um, quote a bits from Emerson as I begin and ask Nora to hold up a couple images of Bistrom as I read from this, this quote just to see the, the kinds of associations that I feel that can be found. Not necessarily that Bistrom and, and Johnson spent all their time reading the Transcendentalists, but that there are affinities, uh, and it's those affinities I feel <coughs> are constant through the culture. Okay. Yeah, so they're right, right Whoops. there. Whoops. Yeah, this one first, yeah. I do apologize for not having slides. I only found out I was doing this lecture last week and not having my own slide library for 
uh, New Mexico painters. I didn't have any, and I made every contact I possibly could. And the one place we could have had them was from the University of New Mexico, but you have to be a graduate student or a member of the faculty there to have them. So we'll, we're doing what we can, and we ask your cooperation with, <laughs> with the slides and apologize for any awkwardness there might be. <clears throat> so this is from Ralph Waldo Emerson uh, from his book of, e the first book of essays. And this essay was on self-reliance. Man is his own star. The power that resides in him is new in nature, and none but he knows what that is, which he can do, nor does he know until he has tried. And this, uh, if we switch to the next one. This painting, I'll read that again. The man is his own star. The power which resides in him is new in nature. And none but he knows what that is which he can do, nor does he know until he has tried. I would point out that Bistrom's title here is Man the Unknown. <laughs> very, very starry man, too. <laughs> um, <laughs> it is, there is a pre-established harmony, a sculpture of memory from which man's experience comes. The eye was placed where one ray should fall, that it might testify of that particular ray. In the images, particularly of Bistrom, but many of the transcendentalists here in New Mexico, you have that sense, the, the luminosity that is used in the linear and gestural uh, movements in the paintings, um, for me, are very evocative of, or, or Emerson's writing is very evocative of this, his effort to express this sense of transcendental. He uses these words, the reference to star, we find a lot among the transcendentalists here in their writings. And this, the rays, the light, etc., is um, all very evocative of each other. Um, so the eye was placed where one ray should fall, that it might testify of that particular ray. Bravely let him speak the utmost syllable of his confession. We but half express ourselves and are ashamed of that divine idea which each of us represents. But God will not have his work made manifest by cowards. It needs a divine man to exhibit anything divine. Great, uh, trust thyself. Great men have always done so betraying their perception that the Eternal was stirring at their heart, working through their hands, predominating in all their being. And we are now men, and must accept in the highest mind the same transcendent destiny. Let us advance on chaos and the dark." And, yeah, this, uh, the space angel, which actually uh, Bistrom uses the word space, space angel. It is very evocative of this, uh, what in our late 20th century, our imagination has already started to grasp the sense of the cosmic, the universe, in, in a real practical way compared to earlier in the century. But um, the evocation of chaos uh, at this time when Emerson was writing was perhaps more of a moral term, but it's something that even in science now um, we have taken much interest in in this century. And in the Transcendentalist paintings, through that preoccupation of getting beyond the representation into a state of what they call transcendence, into this state of absolute simplicity, um, we it seems to me, are naturally somewhat drawn to our sense of the universe as a whole. And we do find Bistrom and Johnson both at times working on what they call cosmic themes and uh, cosmic forces. Um, I'll come back to that later because we do have a painting of Johnson entitled Cosmic Themes and one of Bistrom entitled Cosmic Forces. Is it in here? Um, Cosmic forces is in there, and it's identified with a little okay. yellow tag. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Maybe we can show it now and repeat it again. There it is. Okay, this big eye. Um, this is a real interesting painting because he 
we have the ground of darkness there, the ground of the unknown, and yet in that sense of cosmic, through the light and the movement of the light, he has traced out an eye. And um, this is unfortunately a very small um, image, but it's one we'll, we'll end with, but I'll point it out now as well. Um, this is in... 1974 that Raymond Johnson did this painting and we will pass these all around later and look at them more specifically from the point of view of painting and gesture and construction and all but this is sort of the, the first sampling um, I find that this central color which seems to be of, of blue that has such depth and such magnetic power in this painting by Johnson um, is evocative of an eye and I, when I saw it the first time I thought it's like the third eye, it's like, like the intelligence behind the third eye and, or the different eyes indicated in so many different cultural philosophies and mythologies so when I saw the Bistrom one I thought that was quite interesting that um, he evokes again the eye as well this sense of that intelligence, that deep intelligence, um, the unwordable intelligence. Um, and also in both, both paintings, there seems to me a sense of magnetism, both in the overall field and then in the use of the center of the painting, one with this purity of color and the other um, with something a little more figurative, but which does draw us definitely uh, to some kind of contact with the painting and some kind of experience uh, represented there. Um, Emerson also speaks about... <clears throat> okay, for, the, for now that's fine. <laughs> Can I pass this around now or do you need it like... Um, I think I'll still need it a little while and then we'll pass all the images at once so that people have different things. Okay, okay thanks. Um, Emerson also speaks of this magnetism that I've pointed out we can sometimes feel in the Transcendentalist paintings. He says, the magnetism which all origin, or sorry, the magnetism which all original action exerts is explained when we inquire the reason of self-trust. Who is this trustee? What is the nature and power of that science-baffling star, meaning the man, the human being, which shoots a ray of beauty even into trivial actions? The inquiry leads us to that source, at once the essence of genius, of virtue, of life, we call spontaneity or instinct. We denote this primary wisdom as intuition, with a capital I. <laughs> In this deep force, the last fact behind which analysis cannot go, all things find their common origin. For the sense of being which in calm hours rises, we know not how in the soul, is not diverse from things, from space, from light, from time, from man, but one with them. And this magnetism which leads us to intuition, this name that we have given to this experience, um, was a fundamental, was really the central concept for the Transcendentalist writers with their relationship with nature as well. And we know that Kandinsky as well used this term, intuition, and the Transcendentalists here in New Mexico were very, very conscious about articulating that they were working out of this ground of intuition and expressing from it, manifesting from it. Um, he says, the sense of being is not separate from or diverse from things, from space, from light, from time, from man. And that's where they recognized at the time, the Transcendentalist writers, that this expression of the intuition could be done through art and really only done adequately through art, different forms of art, whether it be writing, um, 
uh, sculpting or painting. Emerson uses sculpture a lot as a metaphor for <coughs> trying to express what he means by the intuition, by the ground from which we manifest, etc. Um, and Kandinsky and the Futures, of course, this was a period at, at the time of Kandinsky in Europe where there were many, the, the postmodernist tendencies were all there at once, Cezanne, Gauguin, Van Gogh, um, and they were all articulating different vocabularies. Um, Kandinsky's vocabulary, because of his concern with translating the spiritual um, and not using representation, uh, was very, very concerned with line and color. Uh, color being the, the emotion of the transcendent experience. Line um, being, he at one point says something, and I have it written down here, some line, um, my, some of these notes are in French, line auditive, tactile, cinétique, the auditive line, the tactile line, the line that can be heard, the line not as a contour, etc., but as the trace of a tactile or physical, sensual experience. Um, color as the sensual experience of emotion, that the, the material experience of emotion that allows us as the material beings we are to have access to that um, emotion, that the spiritual emotion that he was wanting to express. Um, the, the force lines is a vocabulary, is a word that comes from the futurist painters at the time, but which was adopted by uh, many different schools as a real fundamental element of the art of the early century. And it is, as Kandinsky used it, and as the New Mexico painters here used it, an organic, abstract but organic, not abstracted and divisive from experience and from emotional experience of the world, but abstracted from, through the organic experience, um, and the expression of the spiritual. The, the dimension of force that they gave to the expression force line is that uh, pushing upward, they would say. And Bistrom has a painting entitled Upward. Um, the Transcendentalist writers used that sense of the spiritual always wanting to push upward. And the force line, from my understanding, carries that in the, the word of force, carries that sense of that movement upward of the spiritual in its manifestation. Um, uh, Johnson also, uh, in his early years, wrote a lot in his journal about color. And there are a few quotes here that I think are quite wonderful. Um, let's see if I can find them more quickly here. He speaks of color as that element which can express not just emotion, but the creator's emotion. So the ambition is not just to express a psychological emotion of our, our lives, but that emotion that goes beyond. won't paint as a color and material if properly used, if the mind sees light, do what nothing else can do, create the spirit of emotion that is felt and therefore created by the creator. So, not just felt by me, but by the creator, and in my experience as, as a being, I can touch that experience and express it through color. So, this is where 
in his sense of color, in his philosophical, the philosophical weight given to color that Raymond Johnson used, it is definitely uh, totally akin to Kandinsky's understanding of color and how it should be used. Now, what I'd like to do is go through some images for you and simply point out that they are what parts of the preoccupation of Raymond Johnson or Bistrom they touch upon. And then once I've gone through sort of all of them, identifying them, then we'll just pass uh, the books around and then people can have more time uh, with that. So. Some of these are a bit small, but we will do the best we can. And some are in black and white. Uh, Johnson, uh, in his early, first of all, Johnson was from Portland, Oregon. And he went to Chicago, I think it was 19, 1919, to study art. And he was in Chicago when the Armory Show came to Chicago. Uh, no, he was there before then, because the Armory Show was 1913. Sorry, I've gotten my dates mixed up, but I have them there. Anyway, what was significant was the Armory Show brought to the United States uh, paintings of Cezanne, Gauguin, Van Gogh, and caused quite a revolution. It, it really brought all of the post-impressionistic preoccupations to the United States, and the American uh, painters started grappling with these. Um, and Johnson was in Chicago, an art student at the time, when the Armory Show came. And through his journals, uh, we have the documents of his excitement over this, and how um, his mind was liberated from uh, many preoccupations, and his the liberty uh, the freedom that he felt to uh, express his preoccupations was much greater. But still early in his period, he was doing very much like the Cubists and the, the inheritors of Cezanne's preoccupations were doing, as many artists here in New Mexico were. When um, the Taos painters came, the group of ten, right? There are ten of them. Um, we see the preoccupation sometimes with Blumenschein in particular, and a couple others of the geometry of the landscape. Uh, this is Cezanne's preoccupation, the geometry of the landscape. And so in um, his early period, Bistrom did uh, paint some landscape and tried to um, use that kind of construction, that kind of perception in his painting. Uh, it was a, a normal thing culturally to work through that stage of working with the landscape and those preoccupations. Um, he worked uh, very often. Um, maybe I, I guess I should be back here right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not well trained with the videotape. Okay. Um, this is it's a very a small thing, but. You'll see it a little later on. And it's a trilogy of the landscape here in New Mexico. And uh, Johnson did work in trilogies and series. And at this period in his life, in the late 20s, he was working often in, in trilogies. Later, when he did the mural for the University of New Mexico, he did a series. Um, I think there were six paintings. Uh, six murals that he did. So he was often interested in, interested in evolving a, a whole idea through more than, than one painting. And the trilogy naturally composing a whole on its own, whether the series being somewhat a separate con uh, con sequential um, uh, form of the painting. Um, Uh, so, 
we find this early in his time. And here we have, these are three of the series paintings for the University of New Mexico. And maybe you could just approach it for them, if they can see it a little more closely. I'm not sure. It's so small. This is Johnson. Yeah. Can you see it all? <laughs> Can you see it all? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, there is that other blue one. Maybe you could pass the blue one around. This one right here. I think it's in one of those small. Not this one. Oops. Well, we can pass yeah, it. Yeah, well, here it is. Go. It's in here. Okay. I think. Okay. Oops. Uh, working in series and trilogies is not necessarily uh, not much of a preoccupation that Bistrom had, but it was definitely one that, that Johnson had in the development of his work. And it's very, very interesting. Um, in a given series, for example, in this one, uh, the one of the main elements of Johnson's preoccupation was what he called, and what the transcendentalists at the time called, and the futurists called, design. It's not what we mean by design now. Design now has become a purely functional sort of thing, but what Johnson meant by it was a unifying principle where an order is given through the composition in harmony with the color and the gestural movement which really expresses in the construction of the painting what they call construction rather than composition, in the construction of the painting, expresses, again, this ground of being in its simplicity, this absolute, this non-represented, uh, non-identifiable uh, experience from which we come, this God, this transcendent, this highest law, whatever. So that all of the elements of composition contribute. Gesture is definitely, um, should I say, an innovation of the 20th century <laughs> in painting. And as you know, Pollock here in the States took gesture to great heights. Um, gesture being the movement, the natural movement of the painter as he expresses through line or through paint application. Um, for Johnson, through the airbrush, the movement of the airbrush, um, where a sense of spontaneity and immediacy is given to the painting. That, I think, is the major quality of gesture, is that sense of immediacy that is being looked for uh, with the simplicity. The design or unifying principle is very much this ordered sense of the whole surface, this construction of the surface, even if it is very abstract in terms of not having much object or whatever, there is a fundamental order to it, a fundamental composition. And the, the design or unifying principle pulls together all the color and the line, all the other elements, the gesture, etc., of the painting, and gives it this sense of order. Now, these are, I find, uh, easier things to see in the painting than they are to try and describe, because they are really uh, rendered well by these painters, and particularly Johnson in his sense of the unifying principle. Uh, the two paintings we looked at earlier, the Bistrom and the, the, the two eyes, um, you can sense, I think, that fundamental sense of order in the the total abstraction of Johnson's piece, just with the color and the blend uh, of space. But it is ordered. It is not um, left to chaos, <laughs> if you wish. You know, we have, he has approached chaos and really done something with it. <laughs> um, 
so these are the basic elements. Gesture, uh, design or the unifying principle, line and color. We're all thought of in a completely new way um, as the century began uh, with the um, Europeans, particularly through Kandinsky, who influenced the people here. Now what I'd like to do is, I don't know how much more time we have. How much time do we have? If we could... Yeah, that would be good. For, say, maybe 15 minutes or so, we could take some of these books, these references that we have, and just spread them out among everybody. And that way everyone can be looking at different um, dimensions at the same time. <coughs> and... I can go around and kind of <laughs> and the, the Beastrom book is here. And if you have any questions right now too, I could easily answer those. Uh, and, yes. Could you uh, talk a little bit about Emerson's theory of the oversoul and its effect on creativity and its reference to intuition and how how that ties in with Beeston and Johnson. Um, would you like to say a few words about that? I believe that all creation came from a, gen a general soul mm -hmm. that all living beings shared right. and that uh, we, d we do nothing without putting ourselves in the flow mm -hmm. of the oversouls. Mm -hmm. Is that true? Is that, yeah. did, did Johnson believe that when he painted this? That um, he, he, he could only create when he was getting his feelings and inspirations from something outside of himself. Mm -hmm. I think that from my understanding of both Beeston and Johnson, they both, I would say that Beeström was perhaps a little closer to Emerson uh, than Johnson. Yeah. But they both felt that fundamentally what they were expressing was that experience that of experience. the oversoul. And that kind of trance experience, actually. Mm -hmm. Emerson referred to it. Mm -hmm. And that Johnson speaks you know, of... Yeah, but you could not create by thinking. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it's in that sense of the trance and, and something a little more exotic, perhaps, that I find Beeström a little closer to him. But Johnson also speaks of needing to create a very protected environment for being able to communicate in this way with the sense of being and the sense of experience. And it's really only when you are, or when he was, uh, working with that, that he was doing what he intended to do, that he was meeting his purpose. Um, Johnson has a little bit more of, well, he goes through a period where in the 50s he's reading a lot about Mandillon, and both Beeström and um, and and Johnson have some works where you can see the more constructed type of preoccupation. And there's one little pamphlet that has the, um, a wonderful picture. Let me see if it might be this one. Oh yes, this, this you can definitely recognize the element of Montbrion's work and the constructivist approach here. So in the 50s, um, Johnson did get more involved with uh, the more constructivist approach. And Bistrom, I think, and, and writers who are more art historians say this as well, 
that Bistram was perhaps the most continuously involved with the spiritual as such in his painting. Um, Johnson was always working out of that same sense of expressing that spiritual ground of being. But he did adapt certain preoccupations for a long period of time where he was relating with some of the other modern uh, painters and working with their preoccupations. Is that painting on the wall there, this one? Uh, yeah, this one. Is there a title for that? Untitled Abstract. Untitled Abstract. <laughs> and this is Johnson. <laughs> um, Johnson's works are all like polymer number 14, polymer number 48, polymer number whatever. Well, and it, it's all figure 35 in the book. <laughs> well, you know, it's not, it doesn't sound very spiritual. And as I was thinking about them this week and working with these things, I really got to like his simple titles. Like, it's like a documentation, like a chronic of these different states. And they're documented in a way, but the state is still what it is, independently of any name that's given to it. So there was kind of a, an affection that I developed for this <laughs> naming polymer 45, etc. <clears throat> This stood with a Hatha Yoga uh, <laughs> He believed in Hatha Yogis, Yoga oh, philosophies. Yeah. Uh -huh. He learned that all his life. Uh -huh. in, 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 in his house. Uh -huh. And that's where his spiritual lives came from, too. He had regular meetings, weekly meetings on the Hatha Yoga uh -huh. meetings uh -huh. once a week. I knew that many of them were interested, at least, yeah. in Zen and Yoga and. Uh, yeah. 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 He was very much that way. Was he a theosophist also? Uh, the what? A theosophist? <laughs> yes, he was. Uh -huh. too. Yes, he was. Yeah, yeah. He was very deeply in all of that. Yeah. Well, Emerson was a Unitarian, lady, right? Yes, Emerson was Unitarian, but he his writings were breaking from <laughs> the old boys of the Church. <laughs> <laughs> he and his fellows were the rebels. <coughs> that's a, a black and white of that small one. Yeah, that's a little earlier. But I was having a black and white thoughts of uh, thin layers, model layers. Um, it's airbrush. Oh, it's on the airbrush. That's that little blue, that mm -hmm. blue mm -hmm. I like mm -hmm. that from that little purple. Yes, Johnson works a lot of airbrush. Johnson did work with airbrush a great deal. Yes, and let me mention that because he uh, was introduced, I forget by whom, to airbrush, airbrush very early on in like the 20s. Mm -hmm. And this was what one of the major revolutions in his work. And he considered, he says something about how there are different stages that you go through in your work because of your life experience or whatever. But there are a few stages for an artist in his or her work where there is a major breakthrough because of the material end of things and the methods that are involved. And Airbrush for Johnson was a tremendous liberation where he could feel what Kandinsky calls this liberation of color from matter so that the emotion um, can be expressed more purely. This, this search for purity is very, that Kandinsky had was very much a preoccupation, a driving preoccupation on John. Early on, uh, be able to working in that way where he was more satisfied with that um, lightness of matter, not the lightness of being, but the lightness of, of matter through the airbrush. Are there any particular images of that?
southwest there? Um, from my little knowledge of American art history, um, it seems to have been more contained here. In the With the development of gestural painting in the East, there's a reciprocity back and forth and then the eventual development of abstract expressionism. But I don't know if anyone else here is familiar with other transcendental type movements in the States. I'm only now catching up on my American art history, having lived much more connected to the other side <laughs> before. <laughs> Can you tell me, um, how did Bistrom come out of the um, more uh, literal landscape and uh, people to go into this more abstracted form? What was the impetus of that? Um, well, I think we can illustrate that with a couple things here. I think they're big enough to actually see as well. Um, I think there are two things happening. One, uh, he came to Taos with the theory of dynamic symmetry, which is a method of composition, really. And, but he was a theosophist the 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 <laughs> at the same time. And it seems to be when he came to Taos that he really began articulating um, the sense of the transcendent and that the dynamic symmetry was only a method of organizing uh, the visual space to allow that transcendent experience. Um, I think, so I think that, that there were his own personal history in art and what he had been exposed to before and then coming here, uh, I'm not quite sure what might have provoked him to focus more on that transcendental aspect. But I think also there's just the general activity in the culture of, of artists in Western European culture, including the United States, uh, where working out many of, these pre of, of the different modern art preoccupations with the landscape was sort of the main tool. Uh, with Cezanne and the Cubists at first. And so um, I think his working with the landscape had to do uh, in part with simply working through those cultural artistic preoccupations that were going on at the time. And then I feel his work evolved into his more specifically personal um, development of his work. And I think in the uh, paintings where you see Bistrom working with some of the Indian subjects, uh, you really get a sense of his transition from the more <coughs> naturalist representation of things to the more abstract. And I'll show you a couple of those. Um, there's one real famous one of Kasharis, uh, all interlaced in this incredible design. It, it's like an Escher or something. It, it's quite amazing. And I think that that kind of work that he did was really very much visually depicting this concern that he had with capturing the spiritual element. It's not by chance that he, he chose a Kashari. Kasharis being the highest on the spectrum of, of spiritual life and possibility uh, in the Indian belief, in the Kiva system. So it's not by chance, I don't think, that that drawing, um, that he chose a Kashari, it just wasn't because it was interesting, because it was black and white stripes, you know? <laughs> it wasn't just the design, quote, in our, our words, of late 20th century design. It was the subject mattered. This was the fundamental revolution of art at the beginning of the century, both in Europe and here, was the subject was changing. It was no longer that outer subject. It was trying to capture 
uh, the experience, even if they were still using the landscape or whatever, there was still that personal dimension of the painter uh, in relation to that experience. So for those of you who know that Kashari design of Bistrom, I think it's real, for me, representative of how his mind was evolving. And we have a couple more here that I'll show you that I think are uh, dealing with the same preoccupation. This one here, that um, it's Kachina heads from an eagle dance, and again, you have not o only a dynamic play um, of the, the natural forms of the Kachina, whatever, uh, together, but you also have it in a circle, and both Beeson and Johnson at times we're concerned with spheres. You may have noticed um, in the cosmic uh, painting of Johnson's, uh, it's all spheres layered one on the other. And I see those spheres very much as resonant of Emerson speaking of the whole. Con we, we think of ourselves in parts and pieces. We think of the world in parts and pieces. And yet the whole self is constantly there, and the whole self is part of this greater whole. And uh, in the space angel that you saw in the beginning, these dynamic, luminous circles that he had, I think that, that the circular form is definitely ref uh, referential and reverential, uh, referential to the... Uh, a sense of the transcendent in their work. Uh, so th this is one that is similar to the treatment <coughs> that Eastern gave to the Kashari drawing. And uh, there's another one in here, too. This is a, a dance, you know, the corn dancer, one of the Indian dances. And there again, um, he's going beyond the representation, but he's still using representation. And this uh, the drummer is obviously present here um, in the composition that he's given. And this reminds me again of one essential element uh, that comes from Kandinsky's articulation of things is music. Uh, Kandinsky, in order to express his sense of meaning of what color could be in painting, always referred to music in um, the spirituality and art, um, he's constantly coming back to the reference of music. And music as being an expression without being loaded with all kinds of other interferences, being more easily an expression of this intuition of the absolute, of this ground of being from which we manifest. So um, I think in this uh, design in the Emersonian sense here that he's given us, we really do have a sense of going beyond the actual experience. No, but it's, it does, does evoke um, for us, I think, that reference back again to the Um, since we're mentioning music and Kandinsky, there are two um, paintings in here that you certainly have a sense of musicality in them, um, and they're very <coughs> Kandinsky-like as well, I think. You also have a sense of construction, which is not contradictory. Um, the the piece that I mentioned, the image of the Mondrian-like painting that Johnson had done, there's definite musicality in that as well, but it, it's more static. And Kandinsky was very rarely static from the little bit of his work I've seen. And these two pieces by Bistrom, I think, are have very much that 
sense of move, movement in space and lightness in space that make the musicality of Kandinsky. And it's lovely, the combination of construction and musicality. This one was part of a series of sailboats that he did, a whole bunch of them. He mm -hmm. used to work in series of, once in a while you get the one series of one type of thing. This is real evocative of clay, too, because he did a number of boats, and it has that kind of okay, that's the joy. That's a musical one there. Isn't it? It's really lovely. the elements of gesture that we see both in Bistrom and in Johnson. And I'll take back one of the books for that. It's very interesting because in Johnson's work it's quite easy to see uh, over a period of years his preoccupation with gesture and how it contributes to his own personal development of the abstract, the absolute. And it eventually fades away and I think is only present at the end uh, in the, in the um, color. And, and it's a gesture as a form is not really that present to the painting. So, we'll get a few of these. Okay. So, I'll show you first um, this set of three uh, paintings here. One, you may even feel that there might be some affinity with that preoccupation with the Kashari that Bistrom had because of the use of black and white. And then we'll look at another one that's even more gestural. So... Again, when we interested in a conceptual, rational, abstract art, he was interested in an abstract art that was very organic and that really grew out of emotion and experience. And we see him working with the gestural element, very ordered, very peaceful, very calm, uh, as his work is, but definitely concerned with the gestural. And this is, I think, fairly untypical of his work, but it's perhaps more recognizable in the Jackson Pollock style of gesture, <laughs> this one here. And then later things become more like this, where the gesture is even toned down a little bit more, and then eventually disappears. Here's more his typical kind of 
kind of preoccupation with gesture. And then... That's more hard than gesture. Pardon me? All his work is more hard edge than mm -hmm. gesture. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. that's... Uh, Right. Yeah, well, and that's why I wanted to show this, because this is what we usually think more of, uh, is more gesture, is something more like this, where the paint is looser and the whole rhythm is much looser. I agree with you in my perception. He... Uh, yeah. Well, the reason that I'm, I'm talking about gesture the way I am is just taken from like his writings and his articulation of gesture. And for me, it, the, the word was always much more associated with Jackson Pollock and that kind of more scribbly kind of stuff. Uh, Would you, could you say a little bit more about gesture? Because I think well, that might add a... Uh, gesture, I think he describes it very well. What you're saying is right here, in this statement right here. I'm just reading it. Read it up, love. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Johnson, the consummate uh, craftsman, manipulated his materials with the same intensity and integrity which he used to focus his theoretical positions. Johnson's paintings from first to last record the directions and resolutions of his search for the means to define abstract pure emotion through rhythmic harmony of the elements of painting and through the unity of design. So he was trying to attempt the opposite of gesture, using design and uh, trying to convey um, spirituality. And here, Johnson believes that the truest and best of our design and painting is sophisticated and sacred. I call it sacred because with this creative use of design, a spiritual height can be attained. It's a little confusing, but he's been making a point there. Yeah, and the, the, demand, the thing of gesture in terms of American art really is it's just more emotional. It, right. it deals with almost non thinking. Right, exactly. You're just feeling without an thinking. immediate physical sort of expression right. of that. Mm -hmm. And that is what most of us has come, have come to think of as gesture, and which really in this century in American art, that really is what gesture has meant. But the reason I've spoken about gesture the way I have tonight is because gesture was still very much uh, one of the basic elements in Johnson's vocabulary when he would talk about art. And this, I think what I just showed, as uh, yeah. this gentleman just pointed out, is much more hard-edged compared to what we think of as gesture. But this is the dimension of gesture that was important for him as, as he was trying to bring everything together in this sense of design and this unified principle that would give order to the painting. So it is, you know, there are definite nuances, especially in terms of gesture in relation to what he means by it and what 20th century American art history might mean by it. In Bistrom, you have some of that looser, looser gesture um, throughout, and there are a few good examples here, a couple pages in a row. Sorry about the microphone. <laughs> Either talk to them or talk to you and then talk to them. <laughs> so um, we can see I'm not real familiar with how much actual looking at Oriental painting of Eastern did. But he obviously was influenced um, and many of his works reflect even the spatial relationship that's more oriental than, than um, so in these few pages I'll be showing as I go around, it's both that oriental influence and the gestural influence together. Yes. 
And sometimes the gesture is heavier with paint, and other times it's lighter. In that sense, he varies more um, than Beeston or than Johnson does. Do you see how that calligraphy effect? Oh, that's a, he gives a y y yoga philosophy, just mm -hmm. mysticism, but he mm -hmm. believed that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was a part of his whole thinking. Yeah. And, um, yeah. There, too, you yeah. definitely yeah. see the Oriental. Uh, he also did landscapes mm -hmm. as pot boilers, he said. He pot called his landscapes pot boilers. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. That the other thing was spiritual. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> that answers your question, see? <laughs> yeah. Um, Okay, well, I'll, first I'll go around with this. <laughs> yeah, I had a professor once asked me, Ray, why are you always going out into the landscape to uh, draw snow geese and things like that? And I said, it nourishes me. <laughs> 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 and these finer lines you see here, yeah. it's real interesting. And and I'm going to I know he and Johnson are really credited for the transcendence. But you're right, it was only out here. I'd, I'd like to venture something, and I don't know if this is true or not, but of course Johnson and Beeström are both credited with uh, the Transcendentalist Movement here in New Mexico. And this morning I was in the Gerald Peters Gallery having the great pleasure of sitting among a number of, of uh, Johnson's paintings uh, because they managed his estate. And uh, so there were a few paintings that were most intriguing for these uh, beautiful flowing lines in pencil over the airbrushed color and then some um, like acrylic type of paint on top and when I was looking at these room tonight this belongs to the gallery here I was seeing a few of these paintings that have these fine lines all over the background and they predate the Johnson period where he was using that effect by about five years, so I thought, aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> but that's the communication, you know, in art, in between artists. Of, of whoever's invention it was, it's something that can be, you know, can stimulate uh, the other people and get them going. It's, it's these line effect ones that made me think of that this morning. Because there are some Johnson ones that have oh, these fine lines, more circular, more spherical. In the background, like this? Yeah, in the background, not the overall composition, but just the, the use of lines in the background kind of thing. Yeah. So oh, I think we've touched on most of the major elements. Let me see if there are a few others I want to um, One thing that the Transcendentalist writers and the Transcendentalist painters here in New Mexico have in common is that when people ask them about the name of their movement, they were always very vague. <laughs> um, but 
uh, Johnson does have some uh, some writings where he does, I think, pin it down a little oh. bit. Um, there was another, two other words in the vocabulary of the transcendentalist, luminosity and, and rhythm. We've touched on rhythm through the music and, and through the color and through the sense of life force that comes through the line force. But the luminosity is definitely linked with the color, that sense of light that goes beyond and can penetrate with the color, help us penetrate into this other uh, ground of experience beyond our daily life. And there is a quote from Bistrom, I think, where he simply says that they consider, or that he considered the sense of the transcendent as simply going beyond the daily experience, beyond the ordinary experience. Um, the luminosity is part of that dimension that allows color to liberate the painter from matter so that spirituality can be expressed instead of just representing other material uh, life. Um, I wanted to finish with a quote, a couple quotes from Johnson. Uh, that I think bring a lot of these painters' thinking up to us. We're not quite a hundred years later, but <laughs> at the end of this century, I think there's much of their preoccupation that is really very relevant. And I find uh, what I mentioned in the beginning about uh, when I read Emerson of the... Um, a God not needing cowards to represent <laughs> or to express uh, the spiritual reality. Uh, definitely these people were courageous people. I think uh, even people who still come to New Mexico and stay these days are courageous. But, <laughs> but at the time, these were people who were very much the nonconformists that Emerson and the transcendentalists uh, told people to be, and who really, really were convinced and committed to their search for expressing through their art. Um, at that time, I think New Mexico, and those of you who may have known it more, I knew it as a child and fell in love with it, but I didn't really live here uh, as I grew up into an adult, and so I was maybe not so conscious of it as some of you may be, but I think at the time that they did come, it was a place perhaps that was a kind of protected place in the sense that it was further away from um, the usual established concerns of American society, and people were freer from the um, admonitions of that uh, Eastern society and could feel their freedom and the landscape too could call them to this luminosity of, of being and I personally still feel that is very real in the physical fact of being in New Mexico but in terms of the social fact of living in Santa Fe it's very difficult <laughs> to maintain that uh, the society is more complex and, and much more Confused, actually, I think, than it was uh, before. But I think that um, Johnson and Bistrom have both left us uh, from their writings certain things that can, because they did live into our century. Uh, Johnson died in 82, Bistrom died in 76. So it wasn't like they had these preoccupations and then disappeared from the face of the earth. They continued working, and they continued working late into this century where uh, perhaps a place they had come to was not so protected anymore as it, it may have been for them in the beginning. So I'd like to read um, two quotes uh, from them that I think can, we can draw inspiration from at the end of the century and that we can be aware 
or it seems to me anyway, that this transcendental spirit, uh, wherever it comes from, is definitely integral in the American mind, in the American culture. And we have like outcroppings of it here and there in our short 200-year history. And I feel that it is one of the elements of our uh, philosophical strain that has allowed um, our individualism uh, to be a little more meaningful than just uh, a terrible materialistic materialism, which which is threatening us even more now than, than it ever did before. But I think it is one, the, this spirit that these painters manifested and that the uh, transcendentalist writers manifested is really one of our saving graces in the American culture. So I think we can still look to it for inspiration. And I'll read these two quotes. You won't believe you won't believe the first few words of this particular quote. <laughs> Excuse me for a moment while I get my page numbers clarified. Easterman and Johnson uh, and the oversoul and the somewhat mystical quality that we might think the transcendentalists had. Um, Johnson said at one point, my painting was not about trying to be a modern painter or a transcendentalist painter. It was a way of working out my own salvation. And I think there's something very, very practical about that and, and deeply honest as well. And I think it's out of that kind of honesty that great art is created and mm -hmm. that the human community that we are can profit from the experience of, of the painter. And here's Bistrom's... Uh, somewhat prophetic statement, perhaps. The new age... <laughs> that's what he said. <laughs> the new age promises to be one in which humanity will strive through many avenues of expression, an era of a new kind of freedom, not a thoughtless, haphazard freedom of befuddled intellects, but one where realization of self will be brought about by the understanding of laws and principles. And the transcendentalist movement is definitely concerned with laws, deep laws, highest laws, but laws, the order, the fulfilling principle, etc., the unifying principle. The creative artist will discover that he cannot express anything higher than his own character inspires. Unable to hide under the cloak of this school or that tradition, he will bear the totality of his life's experience. Through self-discipline and contemplation, tolerance and vision, he will become the synthesizer of the reality of religion and the truth of science. And I think that's very, very appropriate because now the astrophysicists and the physicists, uh, through the insights of, into quantum dynamics and that kind of thing, um, are getting closer and closer to the artists and the literary people because of the phenomena of creativity that seem to be at least metamor uh, not metamorphized, but at least to have some kind of metaphor in the perceptions of quantum dynamics. So that was Bistrom and his perception of the New Age, which I liked. <laughs> and this is a quote from Johnson speaking to his students. Better move over here. So much can come between what one can do and what one actually does that we all need to look life squarely from the front. America today faces the possibility of greatness and decline. The world generally is on the decline as we are all sadly witnessing. 
your generation has the terrific problem of keeping calm, loving, and working out the program for living as brothers and not savages. Always during murder, hate, chaos, disorder, it is necessary that a few humans keep calm and work constructively. And I believe it best to work in an entirely different medium to that used by the haters. Right now, we need works done that present a high state of order. They will not be seen by many, but that does not matter, for the act of doing releases that power, that sincerity, and feeling that must have their effect. I realize this places a new aspect and function on the creative arts. I intend it to. And we shall see what the future brings. Thank you very much. <laughs>